Well, as Wade mentioned, he and I have been friends for many years and uh, grow, grow very quickly while Wade was at Asheville Road to, uh, to come to love him and Jennifer very much. And I can honestly say that uh, I wouldn't be a preacher today were it not for the influence of Wade. And uh, he and I share several things in common, probably the most significant being our love for the Lord. And uh, secondly, we both married up. Appreciate the congregation here at South Haven. Uh, you've been in my prayers even before uh, we knew that, that you all would be the congregation that took over the work for the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Uh, don't realize many times what we're getting ourselves into, but know that the prayers of many throughout the brotherhood are with the eldership here in this congregation as you take on that great work. And we pray that it will be something that glorifies our God for many, many years to come. Where did all the money go? Where'd the money go? I, I can just imagine that that young son heard that question, probably even at the party that his father gave on his behalf. If sure, surely, if not then, very soon thereafter, people were asking the question, where did all the money go? That question may be familiar to you too because your spouse may have asked you that same question. Where did all the money go? Or as Brother Avon Malone used to tell us in preaching school, you got too much month at the end of the money. That sometimes reaches epidemic proportions. And, and here clearly in the story of, of the prodigal son, we have a situation where, where money was not treated properly. And we have another situation that uh, we read about in the Gospel of Mark in the 10th chapter. An account where we hear of a man called the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and asked, hey, what do I have to do to get eternal life? And Jesus asked him about some of the, uh, the commandments. He, All these have I've kept from my youth. But there was something else. Something he was still lacking. And Jesus told him to sell everything that he had, give it to the poor, take up his cross, and follow him. One of the things that we can learn from the story of the rich young ruler is that the way we handle our money can indeed be a salvation issue. I think you need to walk away from our tent with that impression. The way we handle our money can indeed be a salvation issue. One of the nice things about speaking toward the end of a lectureship is you have everybody else's material that you can build from. I'm so thankful for our brother Cliff Goodwin and the lesson he just gave when he talked about fornication and how important it is for us to understand it's not my body. At the same time, we need to understand it's not my money. It's the Lord's money. We have, a, a, sadly, an epidemic running through the brotherhood that, that seems to go like this. When we think about stewardship, am I a good steward? Well, I'm a good steward if, if I take 10% of what I earn and I put it in the collection plate. That's what we define as good stewardship oftentimes. But notice what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 24. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now the cross that he's talking about isn't a little piece of jewelry. It was an implement of torture, an implement of death. Dying to self. 
denying yourself. I have been crucified with Christ. That's not me except for my wallet. No, that's me including my wallet. And we have this idea that, that oh, if I just give 10% to the Lord, the rest of it's mine. No, it's not. It's the Lord's every bit of it. And for us to understand and comprehend good stewardship, we must get that into our, into our minds and into our, our whole being. It's not mine. I, I appreciate the sentiment Rush Limbaugh uses when he says he has talent on loan from God. I'd like to change that just a little bit and say we've got money on loan from God. And that whole idea that, that we will give an account for the things that we do in the body, guess what? That's the root word for accounting. A profession I used to be a part of. And wouldn't it just make sense if when we give an account for the things that we do, if it, a fiscal accounting wouldn't possibly be a part of that? The Lord's blessed us. What have you done? I think the root problem here, right here in Matthew 16, verse 24, the whole principle of denying ourselves. That's where we need to focus our attention for just a few moments. Denying ourselves. The, the prodigal son, he didn't deny himself anything. What we read in the text, he, he was living, as we would say, high on the hog. Kind of ironic in his case. He didn't deny himself. And I, I, I have no reservation telling you, we live in a society that does, deny, does, does not deny itself. Not when it comes to fornication, not when it comes to spending our money on our own pleasures. That mindset has long gone. Give me what I want, give it to me now. That's the society we live in. And brethren, if we're going to deny ourselves, we can have no part with that mindset. We've got to be different, separate from the world. Let me rephrase that so it hits home a little bit. You're going to have to be strange. You're going to have to be an oddball. You're going to have to stick out like a sore thumb. Because if you don't, if you look just like the rest of the world, guess what? You probably are. That's a problem that we have. Our culture is not helping us deny ourselves. We not only have to go against what our selfish desires are, we have to go against what our culture is teaching today and deny ourselves. When we talk about this proper stewardship, one of the big questions is, what's the goal? What is the goal we're looking for? Oftentimes people have financial goals. I want to be, be able to retire at such and such an age with such and such an amount of money. That's all well and good. But as a Christian, what's your financial goal? What is it you're trying to do? I would suggest for you this goal. I want to be the best steward with the blessings that God has given me. That's my goal. You see, oftentimes we say, I want to have so much money at such and such a point in time. Things happen. Stock market goes up, stock market goes down. Oh no, it's a panic. It's a, it's, it's, this is horrible. Replace it with this goal. I want to be the best steward I can possibly be. What happens if the stock market goes down? Doesn't matter. I'm still to be a good steward. Stock market goes up. You're being blessed. Guess what? Doesn't change. I still need to be a good steward. That needs to be our primary focus as we go. 
One of the questions that we'll invariably ask as we talk about irresponsible stewardship, ask the question, am I a responsible steward or not? How would I know? A couple of things we can learn from Scripture I think will help us in this, in this way. If we look in the Old Testament, there when we see the idea of giving, the, the concept of a tithe is, is brought about. That's, that's giving a tenth. A tithe is just another word for a tenth. That was the starting point for giving. Offerings and sacrifices, were they started there and they went up. You know that, uh, that, that Passover lamb? You didn't get to calculate your 10% take the t Passover lamb off of that. No. That's an addition. That sin offering, that's an addition. Peace offering, that's an addition. Grain offering, that's an addition. So 10% was the minimum starting point. I understand fully that's the old covenant. We live under the new covenant. A better covenant. You have any problem with that? Read through the book of Hebrews. Brings the point home time and time again. So if we're living today under a better covenant, why would we ever fathom that less than 10% would be acceptable? Why would that ever be? What? Let's stop. Why does God want our money? You know, is it that God can't bring about His will unless He has my 10%? Am I that important that God can't be sovereign in the universe without my pocketbook? Is that the way He operates? No. Could it possibly be the reason He wants a portion of my pocketbook isn't for His benefit, but it's for mine? that I can have a proper perspective on the things that I've been blessed with. That I have a, prop, a proper comprehension of stewardship. All blessings are from Him. And when I give Him back a small portion, I'm acknowledging the fact that they came from Him to begin with. And I'll give Him back a portion. So to find out if you're a responsible or irresponsible steward, ask yourself, how much am I able to give to the Lord's church? And if your life is structured in such a way that you can't even give 10%, that's a problem. That needs to be addressed. In addition, there's another principle that I find in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands. Why? that he may give to one who has the need. That's over and above that 10%. Say a, a missionary comes through. We'd like to make a, a special contribution on behalf of that missionary. Can you contribute? Do you have the ability? Or is your budget so tight that you can't spare anything else for that purpose. If you're in that situation where things are so tight, watch out. Are you being a proper steward? Or are you spending your money to the very last penny on you? Back in my days working with hospitals, one of the things that I did, my specialty for several years, was actually cost reduction. And I went from hospital to hospital, helping hospitals reduce their expenses and get things back down where they could survive, in many cases, and, and hopefully be able to, to eke out some type of profit. And, and one of the things I did as I went through there, with all respect to James chapter 5, verse 20, there was a saying I used to use, a strong cash flow covers a multitude of sins. And when it comes to stewardship, that, whole, that principle holds true. You know, you give somebody more and more money, and guess what? Their lack of stewardship can hide. When times are good, you can waste money and not really feel it. 
But it's when things start to get a little bit tough that we have to tighten our belts a little bit. We have to look a little bit harder. Brethren, if the Lord has to bring you down to get you to look at things a little bit harder, He'll do it. If that's what it takes to get the message in your head, He'll do it. I like the approach. I'd rather take care of it first in obedience to Him. Make sure that I have my house in order first so that the Lord doesn't have to ring my bell, wake me up, do something to remind me. It's good to look at your spending in your home and, and make sure that you're not wasting your money on, on, on frivolous things. I love a good cup of coffee. I really do. Ask anybody I work with, I usually walk around like this, with a big mug in my hand. It just amazes me, though, that, that some people get in the habit, the habit every day, of going and getting a $4 mocha lotto, half this, half that thing. And they have to have that every day. Well, $4 a day at the end of the month, that's nearly $100. $1,200 a year. Do you really need that? Is that Starbucks makes billions of dollars in money. Do you really need it? It's good for us to go through and, and challenge our expenses from time to time. The last time we did it in our family last year, look through, you know what I realized? We were paying $80 a month for cable television. And you know how many of those channels we actually watched? Two. I love to watch a ball game. Ask any of my kids. I watch the ball game. But was it really worth $80 a month? And, and as I worked in, in the television business, there's some things that you learn from time to time. And, and with our cable system right now, the way the, the industry is developed, there's really three companies that control nearly every cable channel you have. There's Discovery Networks. There's the Disney Company that owns outright ESPN and all the Disney things and ABC. They also have controlling interest in the A&E Networks. So that's really Disney by a different name. And then there's a third company called Viacom. And they have all of their networks. And pretty much the way the cable system works is these three companies negotiate with your cable company and say, okay, you're going to offer this list of channels. These are all the things that you're going to offer and here's how much you're going to pay us for it. And the cable company says, wait a second, I want to do that. Well, guess what? Say, okay, then you don't get any. Oh. Oh. And that's why you have all these channels. And you ever, have you ever noticed you have all those channels? And you probably, like I am, you, you look at that and you say, there's nothing on. And, and there's some of those channels, and honestly, I don't see anything worthy to ever be watched. And Viacom has some of the worst. But how many cable systems are there that don't have MTV and don't have VH1? And they did something just a few years ago that slipped under the radar of a lot of people. They started up a network called the Logo Network. This comes right off of Viacom's website explaining what they did. And understand what you're doing here. Viacom is requiring you, with your basic cable subscription, you're subsidizing this network, whether you want to or not. Your money is supporting this. And what does this say? For the first time ever, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community has an authentic voice on TV and online. Give me a break. They haven't had any problems getting their message out. What do they need a special cable sound for? They're pushing their agenda. And guess what? You're paying the bill for it. 
There's been talk of, of changing regulations so that you can pick and choose what cable systems, what cable channels you have. Hey, if I can get the ball game, I'm done. Charge me ten bucks a month and I'm saving seventy. I'm all for it. But do you think Viacom wants to do that? No. They want the money. Their, their interest is to group all these together. And the cable companies go right along with them. So as we look at the way we spend our money, am I being a good steward? If I'm supporting that? Am I being a good steward if I support an institution like Home Depot? That recently ran one of their trucks through a gay pride parade in Philadelphia. And they changed the name on the sign to say Homo Depot. Do you want to give your money there? Part of stewardship is what's being done with their money. There's a lot of places we could go there, but pay attention to who you're giving your money to. Remember, we talked about being strange, being different. How many people would be willing to give up cable television because they want to take a stand for the Lord? You see, too often times we make excuses, oh, it's, it's okay. I just don't watch that channel. I'll pay for it, but I won't watch it. And we justify things to ourselves. Brethren, we need to stop that. We need to stop trying to justify what it is that I want, because that's not denying myself. That's not denying myself, that's indulging myself. And that's exactly the opposite of what we need to do. One way we tend to get ourselves in trouble is, is we, we rack up this thing called debt. You see, with a lot of expenses, say that nice big cup of coffee at Starbucks, things get tight, guess what? That's easy to give away, isn't it? I'm just not going to go there, and I'm going to save four or five bucks a day. And that's a hundred bucks a month I've just saved, thank you very much. But you see, if I finance that over a credit card, or if instead of doing that, I bought myself that nice shiny truck with the leather seats and the sunroof and the satellite TV and everything else I could find in it, what happens if I don't pay Ford Motor Company for that truck? They come and get it. They say, we'll take it back then. You see, as we incur debt, we lose flexibility. You lose your adaptability. It's a basic business rule. It plays perfectly good with us on a personal basis as well. If you rack up a lot of debt, you don't have flexibility in your budget. You are owned by the bank. You are owned by those finance companies. You can't pick and choose whether you're going to pay your house note or you're not going to pay your house note. If you don't pay it, guess what? Very soon you're living somewhere else. You don't have flexibility. So if you don't want to lose your house, you need to be careful the way you bring on debt. And make sure that you understand that it's now boxed you in. A lot of families make, make the problem. They let their yearnings get ahead of their earnings. I want it, I want it, I want it. And one of the ways we see this come true? Well, mama has to work. Brethren, if you're in a situation where your wife has to work, chances are you're not being a good steward. The way that works out from a financial perspective, she needs to make a lot of money for it to be worthwhile. Because while mama works, somebody else has to take care of the kids. What happens? That costs money, doesn't it? She's got to have special clothes to go to work in most cases. That costs what? Money. And now, this thing that we now think is a, an essential, a two-car family, we can't do with one car. We have to have two cars. And she has to have a car to drive. 
And, and while she's working, she's not taking care of things at home. So guess what? We're buying prepackaged meals or, or going out to eat more often. And we're incurring all these additional expenses. And guess what? The tax man gets his cut from her paycheck first. So she may make $50,000 a year, and guess what? Probably 20000 of that's already gone in taxes. And by the time you pay for those clothes, you pay for that extra car, and you pay for the gas in that car, that's not cheap anymore, and you insure that car, and you take care of those children, and you spend that extra money on meals, have you really come out ahead? In many cases, the answer is no. The better strategy is this. Reduce your expenses just a little bit. Let mama fulfill her role in the family. Follow God's plan. And things tend to work out much better. Don't let your yearnings get ahead of your earnings. You know, the idea of saving up for a purchase has gone. People don't do that anymore. People don't save up for a big, big purchase. No, we buy it now. We just put it on credit, don't we? It's gotten our country in some serious trouble. What can we do positive? Here's an idea I saw that I really, really liked. Some women in the congregation got together and they had what they called a little coupon club. You know, all those coupons do a good way of helping to save money. You know what they did? They encouraged each other. They clipped out coupons. And, and, and they would go places and they'd take pictures. Look what I bought. Fill up a, a, a kitchen table with things. Paid five dollars for all those things. And they worked with each other and helped each other. Oh, I found this deal on this. I found this deal on that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's encouraging. And, and, and when you get a culture that develops like that, you know what the culture now becomes within the church? It's not one of, of wanton spending and, and gross overspending. But good, responsible stewardship. That's the goal. And that's the culture we need to develop within our congregations. What about investing? Mark Lindley did a fantastic job the other day talking about gambling. If you didn't get a, hear that lesson, get a copy of that. Did an excellent job. One question I often get is, what's the difference between gambling and investing? People don't seem to understand. He did a great job of, of defining gambling, which I define as a tax on people who are really bad at math. Gambling is a situation where there's nothing produced. It's one person giving and a one, another person getting. And it's all just a matter of luck, a matter of chance. Investing is something that's different. Investing is, uh, say for instance, a brother Wade here wanted to publish a book, help the Lord's Church. But he knew it was going to cost him $10,000 to get that book published. It's going to be a bestseller right away. But it's going to cost $10,000. He's got $5,000 sitting aside for that. He needs $5,000 more. So he come approaches me and says, Hey, would you like to contribute $5,000 and I'll split the profits on the book with you? I don't know. He's a great writer. He's an excellent writer. And he does an excellent job. Anything he does, I'd like to make that investment. So I give him $5,000 and he writes the book. He publishes the book and the book starts to sell. And my goal is to help him with his business selling that book. And I invest that money. It's doing something productive. And I hope to earn something for my efforts, for allowing him to use my money. That's the idea of investing. One of the things that often happens is, is when we talk about investing, people don't really understand it that well. And they get caught up in all these schemes. This is, this is investment uh, theory 101. As basic and brief as I can get it. And what we have here, this is, this is low risk and low reward. 
And we've got this line going all the way up to high risk, high reward. Now, what would we have? Well, low risk, low reward, that would be like putting your money in the bank. It's federally insured. It's guaranteed, isn't it? But uh, how much money are you making on your money in the bank lately? If you get 1%, you're doing real good, brother. You're doing real good. Not very much. The, the, low, the risk is very low because it has that guarantee, but you're not going to make much of it. High risk, high reward. There's some, some stocks and things that you can... High risk stocks that if I'm going to risk my money for something like that, you're going to have to pay me well. That's the whole idea. And, and, and the way investments work is this line... All investments gravitate toward that line. If the risk is low, guess what the return is going to be? It's going to be low. If the risk is high, what's the return going to be? High. This isn't rocket science. If the risk is high and the return is low, why bother? Why would you bother doing that? Which, by the way, if you took the position that gambling is merely investing... That's right where you sit. Ultra high risk, very low reward. Why even bother? High reward, low risk. Hey, have I got a deal for you. This is a guaranteed winner, going to make you 20%. Guess what? I can nearly promise you I'm lying about that. If the risk is low, what's the return going to be? Low. It's all a matter of supply and demand. Because if, if the risk, if the reward's really high, guess what? So many people are going to get into it that the risk goes down to being, the reward goes down to being low. It's a self-evening thing, the way it works. You know, our preaching brethren often get a hard time when it comes to money management. And there are some preachers who don't manage their money well. But by and large, the preachers I have met have done an excellent job managing their money. And I don't think it's been appreciated how much, how well they've done and how much they've done with what they've got. And any of you who are getting into preaching, if you're getting into preaching for the money, you ain't too bright. It's not there. That's not why you get into preaching. And, and I think that holds true in most preachers not doing it for the money. And, and we're lucky if we have an eldership that does something like this. That says, okay, those of us sitting around the table here, how much money do you make? How much money do you make? How much money do you make? And you make, okay. Is that about average for a congregation? You know, our congregation averages about $50,000 a year. So we'll pay the preacher about $50,000 a year. If you're in a situation like that, you're better off than most. But the problem is we're comparing apples to oranges in situations like that. Because the man, who, the, the elder who maybe works at a factory and a preacher, totally different. You see, the man who works at the factory, he, he may make a salary of $50,000, but guess what? The company has to pay his Social Security tax. He generally would have health insurance, sometimes even dental insurance. How many preachers have dental insurance? Not a, one. Hey, hey, consider yourself blessed. How about group life? Disability insurance? How much of that comes out of his paycheck? Very little, if any. I uh, had a conversation just on the, I was, I was on the way up here for this lectureship with a person who was recently laid off and found out when, now that she's laid off, she has to pay the whole portion of health insurance, something called COBRA. And that 200 bucks a month went to 1200 bucks a month because she had to pay the whole thing. There's a big difference there, isn't there? On top of that, you see, 
The problem is I couldn't go to Blue Cross and get her policy for $1,200 a month because I'm not part of a group. I'm an individual. I don't get the, 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 the group discount that she would get. I'm having to pay a lot more for that. So, so if you say, I'm going to pay, we're going to pay the preacher $50,000, and then he's going to pay his self-employment tax, he's going to pay his health insurance, if he wants dental insurance, he's going to pay it, if he wants short-term disability, long-term disability, if he wants life insurance, he's going to have to pay that. What about retirement? He's going to have to pay that. You see, we're not talking apples and oranges, apples and apples here, we're talking apples and oranges. It's totally different. And elders of the Lord's Church, if you don't understand that, educate yourselves. There's good books on that material to help you understand what it takes. I'm fully convinced, well I was fully convinced that, that miracles have ceased. They stopped with the, with the first century, thereabouts. But there's some of our brethren who are working oh so hard to convince me otherwise. You see, they're convinced that there's a, there's, there's a miraculous way that you can make children eat much less. You can make cars cost much less. Houses cheaper. Insurance cheaper. And all that is, is just by, by changing the color of a preacher's skin or maybe speaking a different language. And suddenly these miraculous things happen. I thought the age of miracles had ceased, but there's some brethren who don't think so. Brethren will be held to account for things like that. That's prejudice. Ugly, ugly, ugly. And it's sin. No question about it. Our missionaries have a hard time too. Recently, the dollar has just been greatly devalued on the, on the world markets. Who cares? I'll tell you, every one of your missionaries cares. Brother Tattersall, who was here earlier, because of the, the relative values of the dollar and the Australian dollar, what used to be 2,000 Australian dollars is now $800. Swings that big in foreign currency. And if as an eldership you're supporting missionaries overseas and you don't have the foggiest clue what I'm talking about, you need to educate yourself. Because foreign currencies are changing all the time. They fluctuate up, they fluctuate down. You may have just doubled your missionary salary and not known it. The amount of money coming out of your pocket is the same every month. Depending on which way those currencies swing, he may be have his salary doubled or cut in half. And with the recent devaluation of the dollar, in nearly every case, those missionaries are struggling today. When we say we're going to support a man, do we really support him? Or are we just glorified check writers? Let me propose something that may be seem kind of radical, but how about you do this? If you support a missionary in Australia, support him in Australian dollars. If you support one in Tanzania, support him in the local currency. That way any changes in the valuation, guess what? It doesn't affect him. His life goes on and he can worry about preaching the word. And he doesn't have to worry about foreign exchange rates. Isn't that something that we can do for him? Take that burden off of him? As we need to close here, one other thing we need to talk about. How do you teach your kids proper stewardship? How do you pass these principles on to the next generation? Just two quick suggestions, things that you can do that may help this way in, a whole, in many areas. Number one is allow your kids to take on stewardship on a gradual basis. The principle we talked about the other day, Brother Martin did an excellent job. With children, as they mature, you let them make mistakes on a small level 
learn the lessons, and then as they get older and the stakes get higher, they know how to handle themselves. It just pains me to see these youngsters walk around, I've just got to have that $150 pair of tennis shoes. Shame on the parents who buy them. And do you know what you're doing? You're raising up an irresponsible steward. How about this instead? You've got a budget. $100 a month. You're buying your clothes. Even better, how about that part-time job you have? That's where the $100 is coming from. You're going to learn respect for that dollar. Doesn't matter how much money mom and dad make. You're responsible. And suddenly, what happens when you do that? It's one of those things, borders on miraculous. Suddenly, those fancy department stores don't look so good anymore. And goodwill is better than winning the lottery. You know how much clothes? You could get a whole wardrobe for a hundred bucks. Making responsible stewards of our children. The, the, the materialism, we have to work extra hard to rid our children of that. Another suggestion. Take some money. Bring them to a place where people are less fortunate. A place where day-to-day -day living isn't like what they're used to. Where not everybody has air conditioning. Not everybody has cable TV and, and two cars in the garage. Let them see what eking out a living really is. Work with the church there. Take a mission trip there. Do a vacation Bible school there. Sure, you can do it in some foreign country. That's fine. You don't have to. There's places right here in this country you can do it. I, I would go as far as to say there's places in Memphis you can do that very easily. And learn for themselves the value of a dollar. Learn from themselves to respect the blessings that God has given to them. And instill with them the goal, the idea that I want to be the best steward with the blessings God has given to me. When you do that, those whinings and complainings about how come I didn't get the $150 pair of sneakers become thanksgivings for the blessings that they've received. Thank you so very much for your kind attention.